Thank you very much, Edmundo. Thank you very much for having me. Um, it's actually interesting. I will start today and I will also give the last talk, so you have to bear with me. Um, deep learning in the wild is um, uh, the topic for the next 45 minutes, roughly. Um, what do I mean by in the wild? When I think about the kinds of research that I see in my environment, that are done in my lab, I usually see two different things. Um, the first one, and, and they are differentiated by the motivation behind the research. Um, the first kind of research I see, um, I would say, is motivated by making progress on the methodical side, on, on advancing algorithms, on advancing our toolbox. Um, and that usually means that we have some given environment, some, some common data set, some common metric, we are really knowing what you, we want to do, for example, classification of images, and then we try to improve our methods. Um, which is, this is why I put the, the ImageNet um, example there, which is what we usually do as scientists. We, we have some common tasks, some benchmark tasks where we can compare with each other and measure how we make progress. And this is a, one part of the research we do. Goal, advance the methods we have. The other part of research I'm seeing, and especially coming from the University of Applied Sciences that I see in my environment a lot, differentiates from the first type by the way it is motivated. It is usually motivated by an application. For example, a business partner comes and says, you know, we have this kind of machine, we uh, produce some, some, uh, some goods with this machine, we want to do a visual quality control and we want to make it automatically. Can you help us in creating an, a method, an algorithm that, that does this? And the motivation for our research then is this task. Um, so the goal is a, a dual goal. Um, there's some product idea behind it. Product in a broad sense could also be a service, um, could be a startup idea, but th there's a product idea that has to work in the end. And on the other side, it's still about advancing the method, otherwise it wouldn't be research, right? Um, when we have this kind of, of research, when we are motivated not by a clear scientific task, but by, a, by an application, we usually see that the environment is not so clear, it's more wild, it's less lab style, because, for example, the learning target is um, much more unclear. If you have, Mohamed presented it um, on the first day, um, exactly that example of doing visual quality control of these balloon catheters, it's unclear if this is just binary classification, good or not good, or if you have to do semantic segmentation in order to find where the defect is, or you have to do whatever, it's, it's, it's not clear from the beginning. It's, the business perspective is clear, but what, what is the solution is, is still to be found. So the learning target is not so clear, the data is usually not there, and if it is there, it has some quality issues, um, and also how to evaluate the whole thing in the end is, is not completely clear from a scientific point of view. That is what I mean with in the wild. Um, why is it good to talk about it? My idea when I was uh, invited to give that talk was to, to talk about best practices we see when applying deep learning, when doing research in deep learning on um, tasks that are inspired by industry because as scientists we usually seldom talk about it. It is my, my belief that you can motivate it by both ways and, and produce very interesting, very fundamental results but it's much easier for us as scientists 
uh, to write about things, to talk about things that are motivated by general progress because it's so much more, you can easier, more easily compare it with others, you, uh, the related work is clear, um, others know what you're talking about, it's, it, it's just more convenient to write about such things. So what we usually miss when we speak about our science is to, to speak about the best practices, the things that are really necessary to make the stuff work that we have read the in the papers about. So what I want to use the next couple of minutes is to give you somehow a roadmap, maybe even more a hiking map uh, of that uncharted territory of, of the wilderness outside there of ta industrial tasks where you can do pattern recognition using artificial neural networks. So we will do this in four steps. Um, and I will show you four different applications, examples, use cases on research projects we have been doing, we are currently doing, um, that involve neural networks. And I will try to focus on not what our solution was, this is usually written in the papers, and I give the references on the slides, but on the, on the things we learned while applying our methods there and improving them. So I will try to draw lessons learned from every case as soon as it arises and in the end come to a conclusion. So let's have a look at the first project that was meant to be about face matching and our business partner here, that's one of the advantages of having a business partner. They have a marketing department and they produce really nice material. They produce a video to convey what they are doing and uh, I just show it to you. So this is a CEO of the company, a startup from our area. The goal of the application is to do face verification, for example, for a banking application. So it first has to detect the face in the video, then on the passport, and then do a comparison. Of course, this is complete fake. It's just for the sake of the video. It, it, it looks like, like in a movie, right? So, it is a match, that is what it said. So in that case it worked. Um, the company asked our help in order to, 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 to help them build the face verification system. So, because I'm here with a couple of people that know neural networks and pattern recognition, what would be your first guess what, what could be tried to do face recognition on images? Like method-wise. Okay, you're, you're all thinking convolution in your networks, right? And the next thing you're thinking is why does it need a research project? Because um, there has been, for example, a paper by Google about the FaceNet, and isn't that solved? I mean, it worked 99 dot whatever, arbitrary, close to 100% precision. So this is what we thought as well, but we thought that's an interesting case. Let's see what are the challenges there. And what we found out is when we look at the, I hope you can see it from behind, um, when, when we look at the diagram just of the a map of the machine learning solutions that were used in order to, to build the, the face verification system, we see here is the module that does face matching. And actually, it's a CNN com uh, combined with a fully convolutional neural network. But you see here lots of other gray boxes. And this is not the overview of the system architecture in terms of, of software development. This is just the machine learning solution. Though, so every um, box here is another machine learning subsystem that helps for the overall application of doing face verification. So what is it when this is a face matching? What is, what is happening in the rest here? We have here the detection of image orientation. And arguably, you wouldn't need a deep learning system to do that. There are uh, good classical image processing methods with, by which you can do that. But in that case, it has been done by an ensemble of, of deep learning methods. And then, okay, we have, have face detection as well. 
you could do that by a Viola, Viola Jones kind of approach, but you can also use um, a convolution neural network. Then we have the face matching. What is happening up here, and that is actually the, the largest part of the system, is a lot of things going on in order to, do, to prevent spoofing. I told you the application has, has, has something to do with financial transactions, banking. So there's some incentive for the users of the system to appear as a different person than they actually are. And people can get quite sophisticated with this. Um, let's make an example. Three guys, all employees from, from that company, company. We are the CEO again. Um, only one of these images um, is a real person sitting in front of a real camera. The others are somehow fake. What is your, your guess, just from looking at the images, regarding this picture? Is that a real guy sitting in front of a real camera, trying to use a system? One and a half, good. What about this guy? Looking a little bit like a German Panzerknacker. Ah, okay, together we are two. So you're all for, for this guy. The solution is, this is a video played back on an iPad. And anti-spoofing actually worked really nice, like detect, detecting of spoofing worked really nice until three, four, five years ago before the Retina display appeared. But you can imagine if we have a really high res digital display in front of a really low res old VGA camera, it's really hard to detect the difference to actually the real guy sitting in front of a crappy webcam. So this is a challenge we are actually working on at the moment. Um, fact is we have state-of-the-art, like improving state-of-the-art results on all public benchmarks for, for anti-spoofing and it's completely worthless in, in the application because if you ha still have four or five percent error in an application that is to be rolled out worldwide and not just in Europe but also in, in countries where people have different ethnicities, um, it just doesn't work. You, you cannot use it in a, in a high-risk application. So research is ongoing here. What did we learn from, from this ongoing work up to now? We learned that when a case is presented to us and we, see, we, we think we have identified the, the part where it needs research, where the machine learning solution has to be put in, um, it can surprisingly be the case that we need a lot of other methods around it in order to make the, the, the case work in the end. And it leads, needs a lot of specialized models in order to, to perform the task. We will also see that in the next case. I have put small icons here for which case the lessons learned apply. And the second one you will see in a minute. As a researcher, I really like end-to-end -end learning approaches. I, I, I just like it. You, you have raw data, you have a uh, result you want to have, and you build an end-to-end -end system that you can train completely and it figures out how to do the pipeline and everything yourself. I'm, I'm a huge fan of that. Um, in practice, we see it's often much easier to guide the system by, by giving it a workflow and separate specialized models. To make that point, um, maybe let's look into the the next application. The next application um, is actually a finished project, so we really have final results here. Um, it's about print media monitoring. Print media monitoring, you maybe know, you, you, you maybe know from your work at the university, at least in our university, it's a case. Once a month, the, our marketing department sends us a report where the university appeared in the press. And they don't just have a link, they also send us a crop of the article that appeared in the press. Um, and they don't do this by hand, they have actually a contract with a company that is offering that service. They, um, a customer says, I want to know this and this, that, when it appears in the press, and they get um, the article sent by, 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 by mail or email as soon as it appears, like two hours after the newspaper is issued. Um, there's a company from Zurich that is doing this, this since 130 years, I guess. So it's a really old company. 
And they're doing this actually manually. I've seen the people work with the mouse and cutting articles from newspaper pages. They're much quicker than any professional first-person shooter, esports, whatever. They're so quick with the mouse, but even if they only need, I don't know, 1.3 seconds per article to completely crop it, that's not the future. Um, you have to automatize it, uh, at least to some extent. Um, why does it need to be cropped? Because of copyright. You cannot just take a whole page from a newspaper and send it to somebody else. The newspaper, the publisher will object. But it is okay, at least in Switzerland, to send a crop and reflow formatting of the complete content. So, this business partner came to us and said, can you create a, a system that detects which belongs to which article, what part of a page belong to, belongs to an article, and crop it. So, segment a page into the constituent articles. And of course, this is a semantic task, right? There are some rules of, of layouting that you could follow, like uh, if the headline is quite broad, it will not be just this column, but maybe the other one that fall below this headline. You can also use textual input, not just image input. There are dozens of things that could be tried. Our first attempt was to do this uh, using a classifier that basically tries to find the borders between, um, between articles. Just to give you an idea how how it works. This is a nice and neat newspaper page. Um, you see the small blue uh, borders. Here the segmentation of the final system worked really well. When it, this is an example where it doesn't work well, just to show you that we, are, we cannot do magic and it doesn't work 100%. But if you go into newspapers that use more uncommon layouts like uh, the, the Bild Zeitung in Germany, for example, um, the current system still has its drawbacks. This is a thing that you usually have in newspapers and that is a problem for the system. Pages that really don't contain articles, like uh, the horoscope, um, crossword riddles, um, news from, from sports, stuff like that, where you don't have an article structure. This, is, this has to be dealt with uh, differently. But the task is segment pages like that, the normal ones, and ideally also the ones that are, have a less clean layout. So our first attempt, I told you, was a patch classifier that uses a sliding window to classify each pixel if it belongs to a border between articles or not. This is what we did in the first place. It worked OK enough to save our honor as experts in deep learning, but it, it really didn't work very well. And the next approach we tried was uh, uh, doing con um, semantic segmentation using a fully convolutional neural network. We published that on, on the ICDAR conference last year. Um, what does it get as input? It gets uh, just the, 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 um, the image representation of the page reduced to roughly 300 by 200 pixels plus in the second channel, like a second color channel, um, a result from OCR output. Again, as an image, every um, character, that ha character line that has been detected by a standard OCR system from, that you can buy um, is replaced by a, by a black box. So basically, the system has a clue where is text and how does it belong to, to, to blocks, just to use what is available in layout analysis. And what it shall output is a map where everything is black that belongs to the same article and the borders between articles are white. So if you do connected component analysis, you basically get the articles. And that actually works well enough to be in production today. And the company even hired, at the moment, three of our researchers to continue with this kind of stuff. So that was a very successful collaboration. What I want to show you is after we, like, our job was basically finished after that. We were really happy to build a system that can do the job to came up with an idea how to formulate the cutting task as a machine learning task, in that case, as a semantic segmentation task. Um, and it worked. What the company did, with the help of our three researchers they hired, is to build a, an architecture where they can use that in production. You have to think of the following. In the morning between 3 and 5 o'clock, they, they get delivered more than 6,000 printed newspapers that are available somewhere in Switzerland. They scan them 
and they usually manually segment them. And now they want to automate that. And it has to run every day, including weekends and Sunday. So the system has to be in production, like uh, it, it has to be very robust. So they build a pipeline where they can, they created uh, active learning environments, no, not active, online learning environments where it can be trained by what the humans in the loop still, still segment manually for, for other products. Um, they created ways of dynamically letting it compute in-house or in the cloud. They created ways of being able to update the models without disrupting the process. And this actually was in the order of the same amount of work than the research that took place to build the model in the first place, which was roughly one and a half years of worth of a researcher. So a lesson learned from that, continuous learning is basically important in all the projects we are doing. It's not just we build a model, we deliver it, and, and we're happy, we are, but our partners usually need to have the know-how to continually train it. That doesn't need to be live, uh, like every minute, but at least every month, every two months, get new data, uh, retrain the stuff, see that you cope with, with the development of the data. Next thing is processing speed. Uh, plays a role. I'm usually a fan of the method, first make it run, then make it fast. So we care for making it run. Um, but then it really plays a role if, if the thing can be computed, for example, on a device. We will very soon start a project where some of the processing has to happen on an embedded, embedded device. And you cannot just use any deep learning method. At least after you made it run, you have to think about how to make it fast. Um, this is just a symbolic image, but something I found very cool uh, earlier this year, a convolution neural network implemented in hardware, in optics, so you just bring through light and it will directly show you the result because of an optical process. Um, we're not there yet in the application phase, but our industry partners are partly <coughs> experimenting with specialized hardware. Good. If you were here on, Monday, uh, on, 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 on Wednesday, you already saw that case, and I uh, used it as an example in the introduction, the industrial quality control of, um, the visual quality control of industrial goods um, is a project we are currently working on. The company that is our partner produces machines that produce balloon catheters. Balloon catheters are these kinds of things, um, transparent structures, uh, that look like balloons, they're used in surgery to be inverted into the veins to, to blow them up if something is blocking the, the flow of blood. Um, so these are products, because they're used in a medical uh, environment, they need, need to be okay. Uh, imagine the case when there is a, a, a quality problem in the, in the structure and under pressure when it is pumped up, um, there's a rupture in the thing and they want to draw it out again after the surgery and part of it stays in the vessel. That's, that's not nice, nobody wants to have that. So basically what is needed by the ones that are producing these balloon catheters is um, a method to say this one is good, we can sell it to the hospital, this one might have a problem, let's get rid of it. And what we are delivering here is a solution that can do this with vision methods. Um, what are the challenges here? These kind of images have not much in common with the standard images we see in, in labeled benchmark data sets we have. Like ImageNet is photos in the real world. These are, so to say, technical images. They're done in a special chamber, no natural light, no natural environment, no natural, nothing natural about it. It's a technical picture of a technical product under completely technical conditions. Our first idea was, of course, because training data was scarce, um, let's use a pre-trained neural network and tr see where we come to. Moment, do I have it correctly in mind? It, it didn't work at all, like 0%, like not just 40 or so, like zero. Like transfer learning from all the pre-trained stuff you can get on the net doesn't work if you have technical images. What is usually the case when we are working with not with holiday pictures. Um, what else? Class imbalance. Of course, we have much more cathedrals that are okay. 
in practice. And then when it's about labeling, of course, they are eager and send us all the pictures of those that are, that are defect. One way or other, we will have a huge imbalance in the data set between defects and non-defects. The optical conditions are very difficult. These are transparent things, so there are re reflections and all kinds of things that are not non-errors, but may appear as, as errors. And there's a huge variation. This is a plot of the defect size and a histogram of the defect size. And we cannot read the numbers, but basically this is, is it 10 centimeters? 10% 10, 10 of the image. So if this is an image, a defect like that would be a big defect. And they appear, they exist, but most of them are really tiny, like a, a small bubble with air in it or, or, or dust, something like that. Um, how can you cope with that? I mean, in, in the end, if you want to detect all the errors, you have to use a huge patch of the image to classify. But then, in most cases, the defects will just be one or two pixels. And that's somehow a different challenge than you deal with when, when you're working on the standard data sets. It, it's a completely different problem here. So, that's work in progress, so we are not there yet, but we have some encouraging results. Um, and the ingredients are, besides a secret sauce that, that I cannot talk about too much at the moment, um, a weighted loss scheme. The weighted loss is very important to deal with the imbalance in the data set, but it doesn't deal with it completely. It's just an ingredient that is necessary. Um, what was important to, 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 to have an, an encouraging current model where we can build upon was to, to deal with this problem of how big shall the, the, the image crop be? Do we, do we put in the whole image or a crop or a s even smaller crop or how much do we zoom in? Um, we did some experiments on that and this is our, the, this yellow dot here, maybe you can see it in the online version of the slides. Uh, this is our goal. Uh, this is a recall precision curve. Um, we want to have a really high recall and we, it, it's okay to throw away some okay catheters, but we do not want to have any labeled as okay that, that might have a problem. So we're not there yet, but we are already close and we still have 50% of our project time. Um, what we find out during our work, what was very important is that the people that are in the end later relying on, on our solution, they do not just need this curve, like a thorough scientific uh, assessment of how well it does on a holdout uh, test set, that's fine. But for them it's like, okay, that doesn't say me much. Um, they need to understand how the method works. And they need to get at least a clue why could we trust it? And this was basically the reason why Mohamed was presenting the work he was presenting on Monday on interpreting neural networks. We were experimenting with feature response maps to basically, for, also for ourselves, get a feeling when these things here are classified as a defect based on what in the image does the neural network say it's a defect? Does it look at these parts or does it look at, at the I don't know, somewhere where a human wouldn't look. And at the moment, this quite simple technique is, delivers encouraging results. When we get a defect classified, here you have scratches, it really looks at the, at the scratches. And this is also something where our business partner is really grateful for, to, to have a means of seeing what might, that it is reasonable what the method is doing. What did we learn in that project? First, we learned that data acquisition in an industrial project where the data is not there up front takes much longer than thought. We started the project July last year. The project roadmap had it that we would, have, would get delivered a first data set by September last year. We got it four or five weeks ago. So almost a year longer to finally collect the data, label the data, fix all the parameters. And it was not like we were waiting until they came up with something. It was a, an iterative process where we went to, to, the, to, 
to the application partner often to consult them, to have a look at their hardware setup, to say, oh, with this kind of images, I think we cannot do anything. You have to change something. And but what we also realized is, I guess this is my next point, we needed to train them in our method. They don't need to be neural network researchers, but they need to understand even not, not just our, our, the management partner that is, um, but the people that are labeling the data in the end, they need to have at least a little bit of understanding of how a neural network works, what it is doing in order to understand how they should label. For example, in the setup they are using, the balloon catheter is in, in a machine. A picture is taken, it's rotated by so and so many degrees. Picture is taken, rotated, picture, rotated, picture, rotated, picture. Humans label all the defects in every image, but they say, if I label the defect here, and then I rotate it by 30 degrees, I don't have to label it again, because, I mean, it's common sense that, I mean, everybody sees this is the same defect, right? That makes completely sense for humans, and for humans that have never heard about how machine learning works. But we had to tell them, like, the machine does not have common sense. You have to, if there's a defect somewhere in the image, you have to label it. There's no temporal coherence. We heard it on Monday, uh, Wednesday. Very important. This method just uh, takes every image as, as its own case, so we have to have labels for everything. Class imbalance and a shift between what we see in the training data and what happens later on when the method is in production happens basically in all of our projects, so we have to, to care for that. And, and there are really fundamental advancements needed to make the stuff applicable easily on the next case. Okay, final pro no, not final project. Uh, very, very simple. I like, I'm, I wasn't sure if I can bring that here, but I, but I include it in order for, uh, for completeness. Even if it's about research, even if it's about unprecedented cases where it's unclear what to do, our starting points always are simple baselines. Simple baseline can be we try a simple uh, model that we can find online and don't have to train completely from scratch. And even if, if it doesn't work at all, like in that project, that gives us some, some ideas of what is happening. And also, even if the data is not there, what did we do the year? Of course, we consulted the company on, on how to collect the data, but we try to find data that is somehow has some similarities to do first experiments on it, very simple experiments, not totally sophisticated, to find out what is happening here. And then only invest time and research there where, um, where the real problem is. Uh, in that case, we, we reverted to, to that Mura database uh, of uh, X-ray images that has been released by Stanford recently. Um, because it's also technical images, not, has nothing to do with natural pictures. And that really helps to, to bootstrap a simple approach on which we could build. Good. Last example. My, my favorite example at the moment because it works so well and it is together with a startup partner and it really reinforces this idea that applied research has a dual goal. It looks like this will really help a startup business to strive and it already created a couple of very, very interesting research results. So what is a project? It's about scanning music, making music machine readable. What does it mean? You have, like, who's a musician who plays an instrument? At least flute. Wow, computer scientists. <laughs> Musicians usually play by printed, printed sheet music, um, which is all fine as long as it's, it's your leisure time when you're a professional musician playing in an orchestra, for example, having all your printed notes with you can be a, a nuisance. Like the wind blows it down, you have lots of coffee stains on it, after a while the paper gets unreadable. Our business partner is in the business of offering professional musicians the ability to get rid of the paper and play from, let's say, an iPad. And of course, you could do that by just taking a picture of the, of the score, putting it on the iPad, and it would work. But that's not really smart, right? 
Imagine you play the triangle in an orchestra with 130 people. And triangle, it appears twice or three times in the whole piece. So your sheet music is just one page. Lots of pause, then one bing. Lots of pause, another bing, finish. The first violin maybe has 20 pages. It plays always. So when the conductor is saying something like, okay, let's start over in measure 768, I, with a triangle, don't have to, to uh, flip pages at all because I just have one. The, the violin has to flip a lot. It would be a real, really helpful thing for professional musicians if the conductor could, instead of saying, go to measure whatever, just tip on his iPad on the right measure and because it's computer readable, the iPad flips to the right pages. And all kinds of these things are imaginable if the music is not just a displayed image, if it is computer readable. In order to create such an application, what we need is a way to robustly scan music to computer re readable form, for example, music XML. So OCR, optical character recognition, for music. What's the problem? That is an image of sheet music with overlaid bounding boxes for all the symbols. And just to give you a, a taste of why that is difficult, these are same, same size relation. So size is not original, but, but the relation is original. Bil uh, images from MS Coco and Pascal data sets. So if you treat that as a semantic segmentation problem where you want to detect and classify every symbol, current benchmarks are characterized by small images with a few very large objects. Like here we see two or three objects that make up up to 50% of the image. Our sheets are much bigger, much higher resolution, and they have very, very tiny objects and they have lots of them. What makes it even more difficult is um, in the, we heard about it yesterday in the keynote, context matters a lot, especially in, in music notation interpretation. This sign, the sharp sign, has a completely different meaning. If you have it in front of the note, it directly alters the, the pitch of exactly that note. If you have it at the beginning in the so-called key signature, it alters the pitch of every note that is following. Okay, that's, that might be easy, it's just a, a special case, but what about that dot? One pixel in size, maybe four pixels. If it is next to a note, it alters the duration of the note by half of its length. If it is above the note, it's a, called a staccato dot. It means like you don't play it like Softly, you play it like bam. So, in order to classify that symbol, you cannot just regard the shape of that symbol. You have to, to regard where is it. That all, oh, we already saw the ch challenge elsewhere, but these are all the musical symbols we want to detect, around 130. These are not all that exist, but all that are at least reasonably common. They are ordered by their frequency in the biggest available data set for, 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 for sheet music that we assembled and published recently. This is the note head black, the black note. It appears 50% 50, 50 of the symbols in the whole data set, 300,000 pages of real music is a no black note head. Um, as soon as we come to the second uh, row here, like the symbols are already really, really, really infrequently. It's, the symbols only appear a couple of times in the huge data set. Um, so these are the challenges. What can you do? We tried a lot of like all the existing semantic segmentation approaches. They all fail miserably. Why? They haven't been built for that. Um, take, take RCNN for example. It's a region proposal method. Um, it's just computationally infeasible. With all these small objects, you have millions of, of, of pr proposed regions. It, it takes ages. It doesn't, doesn't finish just trying to, to classify one page. And if you fiddle around with the parameters, you make it one in, in usable time, but it, then it doesn't detect anything. So what did we do? We created a method called the deep watershed detector and that is currently being presented at, uh, at Izmir in Paris. Um, that uses standard components, a uh, ResNet, a RefineNet, and then has three different output heads. Um, one that is basically 
doing semantic segmentation, it classifies each pixel. The next one tries to predict the centers of objects so that we can from each pixel classification also say to which object does it belong. Because imagine you have a chord like that. The pixels of, of the node heads, they touch each other. So if you know that all these here belong to node heads, you do not know how many objects there are. You, you have to have predictions for three centers in order to infer that you have three different objects. And the last output is, uh, uh, is for bounding boxes, so we know how big the objects are. Um, and then we input the complete page, an A4 page, 3,000 by 2,000 pixels, roughly. This way, we get context awareness basically for free, because every symbol is seen in its context. Um, that works amazingly well. And to our surprise, we trained it on synthetic scores, because this is what we had. Uh, it works equally well also on handwritten scores. There's a data set out there of handwritten music. It works. It, it's completely transferable. That was very interesting for us. We are currently working on making, so that was very nice scientifically. Now there's a startup. They want to make money for, for it and need venture capital. So they have demos with their um, potential investors. So the, over the summer where we, we were working hard, very hard to to make it also work for a demo with investors, not with scientists. And what did we need for that? We needed to make it run also for the rarer symbols and also for real world images, not just for perfect synthetic scores. Um, and what I can tell as of today um, is that we were able to improve our published score from mean average precision of only 16%, what was state of the art by then, to 70 3% at the moment. Why? Because we didn't stop where it was scientifically publishable at that moment, but we thought about, okay, what does a business need? Okay, they need real scans. They also need to detect symbols that are not so very common. Let's go beyond that. And at the moment, there, a, a new journal paper appeared just uh, a week ago that says state of the art is 24% mean average precision. Um, calculated in a different way than, than in our original result, and calculated the same way we basically doubled the score again. So uh, I'm really impressed by these results. like it a lot. What did we learn from that? Um, I told you that this neural network has three different outputs that we need in order to, 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 to solve the task, and that needed some considerable, let's call it loss shaping. Uh, we reported a little bit in detail in the, in the paper accompanying the talk. Um, we said we first had to train all three heads, all three outputs, then one uh, improved while others dropped again in, in performance. So we stopped improving the one and just retrained on one of them, then the other, then again the one. So there was lots of engineering going on to make it work in the end. Um, and what we also needed to do is um, encode a lot of expert knowledge. This was also um, important, not just for the um, music project, but also for the balloon catheters, um, where we needed to realize that the orientation of a defect plays a huge role in if it is a problem or not. And that informed us that we cannot do standard data augmentation where we rotate the images, if the orientation is important, of course. Coming to, a, uh, to, to the end, what I see when I'm looking at these kind of, uh, of, of projects, and this is what I'm telling funding agencies at the moment, that the usual sequence of you doing some basic research for a couple of years maybe, and then there can come a phase where that gets applied, and, and then maybe later some technology transfer, and then business can, can care for it. I somehow see that this sequence dissolves, and, we, and, and I see it going on in parallel. I see very, very recent research results, not, not older than three months, applied by standard small companies, non-digital, non-internet startup, non-mega company from the Silicon Valley, standard company from the neighborhood, so to say, they are needing these recent research results in order to make their cases run. And in order to make it run, we need to dig deep. This is why I have a Swiss cheese here. We start looking into what is there in the research, and at some point we come 
to a point where there is a something that hasn't been covered yet by basic research. Why? Because it was not a challenge in the benchmark data sets we see. And so there's a chance and a real opportunity to doing something really worthwhile and filling that, that gap in, in the research cheese. So my conclusion. First, it's not just that some very well understood stuff from the past is used by businesses. Like small businesses use very, very recent results three months after they've been published roughly. Um, yes, we need a lot of data for, 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 for training deep models, but it's not like big, 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 big data. The semantic segmentation problem for the newspaper pages was trained on 500 labeled pages plus 4,000 partially labeled pages to give you an example. So it didn't need millions of, of pages. Um, training models on also these shape loss functions that are very task specific can be very tricky. It needs lots of experimentation. This is also why this is not just work for take TensorFlow, give it to a student, make him fiddle around with it for a couple of, of months and then you have a result. You need a very capable person that understands the methods in detail to carry out these kind of, 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 of stuff and identify the problems where research is needed. Um, my final conclusion is that the sequence of basic applied whatever research dissolves and I see this stuff being more conducted in parallel in the, the area I'm looking into, uh, especially pattern recognition with deep learning, which is for me a reason to um, have a lot of projects in collaboration with other researchers from other kinds of institutions in order to do this really in parallel and bring the different strengths together. Thank you very much. For Thank you very much for the question. Of course there are similarities and that's what's basically what inspired the project. Like when the company came to us and we did a quick research, we saw that basically OMR music recognition is done still with the methods from the 90s while character recognition started to use um, deep neural networks to, and, and we saw the usual success. The difference is text, usually like let's say Latin, Latin alphabet, usually just extends from left to right, like all the letters have a, a, a certain height and, and, you, and you don't have a composition of symbols. So you basically have a 1D sequence of symbols that you can recognize. And music makes it more complex by first having composites, like we saw it here with that chord. If we wanted to treat every composite symbol as, as a, a first class citizen of objects we want to detect, there would be an infinite number of objects. So that's imp impossible. So we figured we have to detect the, the parts of the, of the real musical symbols, like the note head and the flag and the stem uh, separately. And second, music is not just one dimensional from left to right or right to left. It's two dimensional. You can stack symbols next to each other horizontally and vertically. So we had to have a method that can cope with this Basically, in, in, in OCR, you could use an RNN that uh, goes from left to right through the, through the image patches and classifies what it sees. And we tried it here and quickly saw that's impossible. We have to have something that looks left to right and up and down. And that brought us to the idea, okay, let's put in the whole page at once and see if we can do something out of that. And that was the, the birth of the semantic segmentation idea here. Interesting. 
difficult and uh, the, the outcome uh, seems to be that basically with deep learning uh, you either actually tackle the problem or at the very least uh, it uh, uh, emerges as a very promising direction for tackling the problem. So the question is, based on your experience, which is a strong experience in the real world, uh, severe tasks and a lot of uh, company uh, activities, do you feel that we are going to the right direction stressing the conclusion of language in the paradigm? Or do you feel that we can tackle those problems to some extent, but we need to undergo different uh, developmental process of brand new algorithms, possibly completely different from what we have now? Thank you very much. That is very interesting. Um, The answer has three parts. Um, one is, of course, um, I'm, I'm, I'm specifically like I, I want to have an ongoing red thread, so to say, in my research. So I'm selecting partners and projects, of course, in a way that we, I can continue with a specific line of research. So I, I will never promote like deep learning is a hammer for every nail. I'm just currently selecting cases where I can continue with something over a certain extent of time. So there are other. Like, this morning, a colleague wrote me an email about an application and said, very interesting thing, I think something can be done, but that's not a, a project for, for, for DeepNet, so give it to somebody else. That's not the interesting part of the answer. Um, what I see is the breakthroughs that we saw in science, like with, with AlexNet and ImageNet in 2012, I, I would say that was, that was to, to some extent a breakthrough because it could be shown things work that had been predicted. Uh, two decades before. Um, there are a lot of applications out there that can really profit from that. And currently we, we saw some examples of, of applications that were not direct applications of this, but with some thoughts you could really make this method used to solve a, a real need in business. Um, as we are not interested in just doing engineering and solving a task, but solving a task that involves research, I'm I'm actually wondering if, if we can do the same kinds of projects, let's say in five years from now, because at some point it will just be take the thing, apply it, it will work, can be done by, by a consultancy company. What I see, for example, at the moment is that we, in that line of research, CNNs and, and, and still image-based classification, not sequences and so on, where really research is needed and we are shifting the, the research questions within our project in that direction, is in the area of interpretability. Like we had first results, very encouraging, interesting stuff, but lots of things are needed first to make it better debuggable for the, for the developer, for the researcher, engineer. Second, to make it conveyable to the one that is dependent on the result, on the decision, so to say, from the system. So that, that, that were two. Last thing. I, I very much felt with what Marco, what you was uh, telling on, on, as on Wednesday, that just still image classification without uh, regarding temporal coherence is a, a, a bad idea and not the, the final word on, on vision, not, maybe even not the beginning. And, and we need, for, for some applications we see it just doesn't work. It's not good enough and we need something else and it could be in that direction. Uh, I think that there is a very interesting 
let's say, debate and also organizational issue which is going to uh, arise in the next few years. I mean, um, this is a kind of research which I'm strongly confident uh, it, 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 it's, it's important to carry out in the in universities, in research centers, and then after a while it's important to start with the, the technological transfer. So I'm curious to, to have your uh, thoughts about you know, the, the world uh, uh, that you have to identify for the technological transfer. Because from one side, you know, um, uh, I'm confident it's important to uh, reach a certain development of, of uh, results in the university and the research center. But after a while, you know, it's important that uh, the activities uh, like the one you are proposing, which are not just uh, you know uh, things which are expected to remain in uh, uh, let's say in papers for years that maybe nobody will read again, you know they have the potential to become applications, real world applications. But it's extremely important, you know, the decision uh, that uh, uh, you know arises when you say, well, this is probably the right time for the technology. Uh, so I very much would like to hear your uh, thoughts about what you feel from your experience about this process. You know, when, when do you think uh, the activity in the university is becomes, uh, you know, uh, with the constraints of the university, with the potential of innovation, but at the same time the constraint of the university, you feel that it's better to, uh, you know, to speak on. I, I, I'm sure I cannot give a final answer on that, but, but some gut feeling thoughts just, and we can continue that later, probably in a, in a bigger round. Um, I, I think I would answer that in the direction that was on the, one of the last slides, that things are starting to get parallel instead of sequential. Um, there, I, I wouldn't say there is a, a, a strict border. Until there, it's better to keep it at the university, and from there, it's better to keep it in the in the in in, in the business, and, and then maybe a very small overlap and handshake. What I see is that it's a uh, together. Um, of course, it that's easier when the research is motivated by a challenging task that has an application. But I think that's not even purely necessary in every case, um, but when, when researchers and, and potential like former researchers that are now in business, I mean they all had a, have a university education and often are filled up to a PhD. When, when, so researchers in, in university and former researchers now in business are in close exchange. Like what do we have? What are we working on? What do we need? What kind of products are we working on? If they are in, in a constant exchange, also in events like that, um, that really helps to not needing to define a certain border where there is a, a transfer, but to, to basically collaboratively work on it. And maybe then a framework is for a while developed in, in the university and then more and more applied by, by a company, a, a software framework. And maybe it even happens that some things that are purely research are carried out by the people at the uh, at the companies because they see the, the case let's in the end the product behind it maybe that's a starter <laughs> thank you for the question okay thank you Dilo, again